When my video editing laptop started overheating and acting up, I decided to get a dedicated desktop PC that has enough power for everyday office tasks, running virtual machines, and video editing. I also wanted the system to be silent, or nearly silent, as I have listened to enough fan noise in my life. Since high performance and fanless typically don't go together in the same sentence, I knew that I had to build it myself. This video is brought to you by PrivacyProShop.com, where you can buy truly anonymous, high-performance LokiNet VPN access. And the best part is that you can purchase them anonymously by using cryptocurrencies. You may also choose to use credit cards. And you can try the anonymous VPN service for just one dollar. This was my list of requirements. Fanless, have the latest generation of high-end desktop CPU, have NVIDIA graphics, Thunderbolt 4, latest generation RAM, and a very fast SSD. I'm a long-time Ubuntu user, but this time I wanted to try the Pop! OS. I know, I know. Ubuntu is an ancient African word meaning I can't configure Debian. Does it count that all my servers run Debian? Another excuse I have is that Pop's packaging of NVIDIA drivers to the installation ISO makes it easy to get the system all up and running. I use DaVinci Resolve and it is really NVIDIA only. Or at least NVIDIA is the only one that works reliably with DaVinci Resolve from what I've read. I know for the Debian purists that's two ills in one. Proprietary graphics and a proprietary video editing software. Sometimes function wins over principle. Because the aim is to be mostly silent, the component that determines pretty much everything else is the heat CPU heatsink. There aren't very many choices, but an Austrian company called Noctua produces one, the NH-P1. It is a big and heavy heatsink, and the fins are made of thick metal to work better with natural convection. The NH-P1 weighs 1.18 kilograms, or about 2 pounds and 10 ounces for those of us who speak English. There is a hefty plate that goes behind the motherboard and the system has other mounting brackets that attach the heatsink securely to the CPU. The package even comes with a Torx screwdriver that is long enough to reach the mounting screws through the heatsink plates. The instructions are easy to follow. Kudos to Noctua for paying attention to detail. But I guess it's easy to pay attention to detail when you charge $110 for a chunk of aluminum and copper. They also ship the cooler with their whiz-bang heatsink compound that is supposed to move the heat more effectively off the CPU. Noctua has a CPU, motherboard, and case compatibility guide for their CPU coolers. First stop on the compatibility guide was the CPU. The i9 CPU wasn't my first choice. I would have wanted the AMD Ryzen 9 7950X, but Noctua's configurator website said it won't work with their fanless heatsink. The 7950X runs too hot, but the configurator said that the brand new Intel i9 13900K works just fine. I just can't expect the highest turbo speeds with it. So it had to be Intel. Oh well. I have made worse choices in my life. Second stop was the choice of a case. A passive cooling computer needs an open design for natural convection to properly function. Noctua lists a vast number of cases, but only a handful of them are suitable for passive cooling. As a general rule, the suitable cases have lots of openings, especially at the top and bottom, and are wide enough to accommodate the enormous heatsink. I chose the Cougar Blazer Essence case. The Blazer case is an open design, so it doesn't impede much with natural convection. I thought it was also one of the cases listed on Noctua's site as compatible. I didn't notice that the Essence version of the case wasn't listed. But luckily, it turns out that it has enough space for the massive heatsink when you use the extended posts that hold the tempered glass panel. Next up, the motherboard. I chose the ASUS Z690 Pro Art Creator Wi-Fi motherboard for a few reasons. It was one of the few ones with Th Thunderbolt 4 on board and seemed to have good passive cooling with lots of heat sinks. Also I figured a professional motherboard as opposed to a gaming board will be a more reliable choice. And this board is pretty impressive too. 
there isn't much missing from it. For instance, it has a USB-C 3.2 Gen 2x2 header. The header gets auxiliary power from the power supply by using one of the PCIe power plugs. That's the only way it can get enough power as it is capable of pushing 60 watts through the USB-C port. That's enough to charge and run my Dell XPS 13 laptop. It comes with four PCIe 4.0 NVMe slots. There are also eight SATA ports along with Intel's FakeRade for the NVMe and SATA ports. For now, I installed a single one terabyte Seagate FireCuda 530 SSD. After the computer starts and the post is complete, Pop! OS boots in three seconds. I'm impressed. Networking is where this thing really shines. It has Wi-Fi 6E, so it covers the 2.4, 5, and the new 6 GHz ranges. For wired networking, there is a Marvell 10 gigabit NIC and a 2.5 gig Intel NIC. You can have some blazing fast connections to NAS devices as long as they have SSDs. Spinning drives can hardly saturate a 1 gigabit connection. Power supply. After working in the IT business for a quarter of a century, I have seen many power supply failures and failing power supplies frying various components. Usually the power supply is built from really cheap components. So I figured I'd buy a power supply that is high quality in addition to being fanless. That's how I came up with the Seasonic Prime TX700 fanless. No noise, 80 plus titanium rating, and big heat sinks. After I ordered the case, I happened to read the case manual and realized that the space for power supply when you have an ATX motherboard is only 140 millimeters, and the Seasonic fanless power supply has a length of 170 millimeters. So I had to mount it in a non-standard position. I ended up putting the power supply where one would normally put a water cooling radiator. That took the drilling of two holes in the sheet metal and attaching the supplied power supply bracket in an upright position. Seasonic's instructions say to mount the fanless power supply horizontally with the top of the power supply facing up. Oh well, poof, there goes another warranty. As I said earlier, I needed an NVIDIA card for DaVinci Resolve. So I did some digging into the various cards and quickly figured out that my rendering needs are well served by the RTX 3060. So, next was to find a silent card. Well, it turns out that that doesn't exist. But the one I have is close. MSI said that the fans on this model only turn on when the card gets too hot. Otherwise, it's silent and that is certainly true. Fans only turn on very rarely, so the PC usually operates in complete silence. It's actually kind of a novelty to hear the fans wind up. The MSI card has an RGB logo that I turned to the lowest brightness setting using OpenRGB. Getting OpenRGB to work on Linux is not the easiest thing. It needed a lot of dependencies that were not easily met. I bought Corsair's Vengeance DDR5 with RGB LEDs. Well, they certainly glow. Having those lights continuously pulsate is somewhat annoying. I haven't figured out how to turn them off yet, so I might put black tape over them or use a black marker. I guess that was a wasted 20 bucks. So, how do the temperatures hold with passive cooling? I've tested with Monero mining using XM rig. I use a GNOME extension called CPU Power Manager for setting CPU parameters. And if I limit the CPU to four gigahertz clock speed, the temperature of the CPU stays between 78 and 80 degrees Celsius. That mines Monero at about at roughly 10 kilo hashes per second, completely silently, except for the occasional clicking when the heatsink expands as the temperature goes up or when it cools down after you shut down mining. If I increase the clock speed to four and a half gigahertz, the temperature of the CPU rises to over 90 degrees Celsius and the CPU starts power limiting itself and the mining performance drops significantly as the clock speeds start jumping all over the place. When I render a 1080p video with DaVinci Resolve, the CPU rises to about 65 degrees Celsius and the fans in the NVIDIA card start turning. 
For everyday work, I keep the CPU limited to maximum 4 GHz, which is like 69% of the potential clock speed. It's almost like a detuned tugboat, horsepower reduced for longevity, or in my case, clock speed reduced for silence. If I need increased clock speeds in the future, I can always get one of those nearly silent Noctua 120mm fans and double my cooling capacity. Pop OS is excellent and DaVinci Resolve installed quickly and without any issues. On the other systems, even on Windows, I have had to mess with graphics drivers. Now it all just worked. Coming to Pop OS 22.04 from Ubuntu 20.04 is pretty much painless. The user interface is mostly the same. GNOME with some different flavors. Pop OS probably has an edge in the polish department over Ubuntu, but they are just very similar. Keyboard navigation is one place where Pop shines. Hitting the Windows key on the keyboard presents a run box of sorts where you can do terminal commands, start installed applications, search the web, open file locations, and switch between running programs. Pop OS App Store, the Pop Shop, seems to work better than the Ubuntu App Store and has both APT and Flatpak software listed. The Flatpak versions seem to be more up to date in most cases. Did you know that LokiNet exit nodes make you truly anonymous on the internet? Traditional VPN is not anonymous. The VPN provider knows your IP address. With LokiNet's onion routed network, nobody but you knows what your IP address is. You can subscribe to High Performance LokiNet VPN service at privacyproshop.com. Also, try the anonymous VPN service for just $1. Thank you for supporting this channel.